Wolfgang hat jetzt gesagt, man wird es nur fünf hinterlassen bei Pirat und den Leuten. Yes, thank you, Wolfgang. I will start where I stopped last time. Excellent choice. Yes. <laughs> So, where I stopped last time was the hexagon, where I always passed by. <laughs> so, that's the picture of Mutabik. Mutabik theory. So, as I said, this time we want to consider homology theories and schemes. And homology theory, uh, this time, does not have such a nice set of axiom as I introduced in the first lecture. I guess we could write down such axioms, but nobody did. Uh, but among, among those uh, axioms would be A1 invariants, in the sense that uh, projection from some scheme uh, across the affine line to the scheme should induce an isomorphism. Mm -hmm. So the, the well-known commodity theories uh, only satisfy this for smooth schemes, and that's why we start with smooth schemes here in this corner. And then we go to some abelian category. And uh, so I mean the, the commodity theories that I'm thinking of here, I'm not sure they tell you anything, but you can follow these lectures just by taking and trust that there exists such commodity theory. So, for example, uh, El Abid et al. commodity is one, or algebraic Dirac, or uh, crystalline, or um, well, utility commodity, which well, we don't know, but that means just really higher chow groups. Chow groups plus <coughs> also. Uh, With the ital commodity, can I choose which ital sheaf to use as a sheaf of coefficients? I was thinking of L adic ital, the usual one. Okay. Mm -hmm. so the coefficients, I am not sure. So, yeah, I don't know. Uh -huh. So, higher tau groups would be some. Tau groups are the following. You take a scheme, and you look at the closed sub schemes, and form formal linear combinations of those, <laughs> and identify them if they sit in some family. And higher shell groups sort of are the same, but you look at a closed subscript of x cross a to the n in some sense for all s, and then you sort of form a big family of cyclic. Just just as an entity. So usual child shell groups are the case n equals zero, and it's included in these higher shell groups. It's just a, it's just a bigger family now. So uh, just. Usual tau groups are, are, a, are a sequence of groups which can uh, indexed by the dimension of the cycles, and higher tau groups are then have two indices also indexed by this other dimension of the defined space that you have. Okay, so these are the kinds of things that, uh, <coughs> that I'm thinking of here, and what about Hodge? Let's say Hodge, come on, if you have Hodge. Yes? So this the lean commodity that's in the direction that would protect her through this, yes? And this also has some hydrogen. The, the, the lean commodity also has some hydrogen structure? Yes, I think so. It goes to each touch structures. Uh, so this will be a sequence of examples of, of, of what corresponds to ordinary commodity theories in, uh, in topology. In topology, we have these Android theorem axioms which almost are those that I listed in the first lecture. Uh, and you can add one more axiom saying that the homology of a point is, is just some group in degree zero and nothing else, not higher degrees, and lower also. Uh, and if you add that axiom, then you can show that there's, at least on CW complex, there's only one homology theory satisfying all things up to isomorphism. That's singular homology. So that's the ordinary homology theory. Then the other ones where you don't have this axiom of the commodity point, 
the extraordinary ones. The sequence of things here should be the ordinary cohorted theories, and then there's also extraordinary ones, like algebraic K theory and algebraic cohort. Algebraic cohort isn't, but it only was invented when this whole setup came up, so it's not something that we wanted to cover in the first place. But yes, it's, it's there. Okay, so then I start drawing this hexagon. And, and the homotopy is different homotopy groups also. Other groups, I mean, stable homotopy groups. Yes, they would also be one of these extraordinary ones, that's right. Um, so this theorem that you stated with ordinary cohomology being fixed, this it does not hold in this set. No, it does not hold. These are not uh, isomorphic yeah. to begin with, but they typically become isomorphic after tensoring with some appropriate ring and, and enhancing the coefficients of these cohomology theories. So there's something close to it happening, but it's not quite the same. There are different theories. And what is the analogy of the point? Is this just a geometric point? Or the base point, the base scheme here. That's Think of, scheme. Yeah. Okay, think of a field and then ah, okay. Okay. And it's hard to model you would get something like a lot of model here. It's really S is a field, no S is S well now I just wrote the base scheme here. Yeah. Set up works for this and uh, I mean in a moment we will generalize and again not even have to talk about base schemes, but and recall any base scheme is just the point from the point of view of the big risk tops of the base scheme. Okay, so um, this theory itself has a bunch of uh, properties. Well, the first, first property is just by definition, they go to some uh, kind of a medium category here, and that is complete and co-complete, so we can pass through the co-completion. And that is given by the Unida embedding. It was the this property we discussed in the, in the one categorical case last time. And it's, the corresponding thing is true for infinity categories. Then uh, another property that they have in common is that they have satisfied like descent for, for something. So we have certain push outs which lead to sort of myoviterous sequences, for example. That's one way to see it. So you can determine the outcome of the cohomology functors here uh, if you know what they do, uh, if you give yourself a covering of your scheme and know what they do on the, on the covering sets, the covering objects, then how to do those. So how, how far can you reduce? How do you mean? How are they? Well, I have a cover and I then like Reduce the local rings or no? No, local rings would be a bit too much. I mean, in the first instance, we, because that's just what people know, I guess, we can take the risky topology and that's just allows your open coverage. So we can reduce to affine schemes, which is already something. But yeah, there, there you start. You can localize further if it helps you anything, but only that you can localize your rings. So to you know the homology of any scheme, I would know, have to know it for all affine schemes. They could potentially all be different. Yeah, and you have to know how to, how to group stuff, and so yeah, it can be very difficult, of course. I mean, algebraic K theory of rings is wildly unimputable. <laughs> but still, it's, uh, for general schemes, you can sort of, it helps you to know it for rings. It's, uh, it, it helps, it sounds to even solves the problem. Uh, so, well, these commodity fields that you're considering, yes, I know. Uh, actually, they respect a bit more of descent that's given by the Nevis topology. I will not go into this, but you can like bother me with it in the exercise sessions. I'm happy to explain you. It actually makes a huge difference in the, in the, in the theory in the end. It gives us uh, long exact sequences for open and closed complement schemes and so on, which would not be available just for the risky thing. So this is really a good thing. And there are more variants. I mean, you could sort of chiefify this here with respect to the Etal cohomology. Then the usual things here would not factorize through it. 
not in K3 and not algebraic uh, rules, and this does not satisfy Italicent. But one can then sort of Italicify and modify the functors so that they factorize again. And you would. So, yeah, that's. So the classical invariants all have this Nebisch descent and they're not really much further. But this was a really good insight by Wolski that we can do a bit more than Zariski and mm -hmm. really gives us a lot of computational tools at the end. Mm -hmm. okay. So the last thing is, I said in the beginning, that all of these things are A1 invariant restricted to smooth schemes. So maybe Um, yeah, I mean, I don't really know an easy example of of where uh, non-smooth schemes fail to be in one variant, but here's sort of an, an like a hint of an example. <laughs> I mean, the Picard group is one. Yeah, Picard group. Uh, it's an A1 invariant on smooth schemes. And Picard group is, is a part of these higher charge groups. It's, it's uh, low dimensional cycles. Mm -hmm. And here's why. I mean look at look at the functor GM. GM is a, is a functor I introduced as a functor from rings to sets, yeah, which sends a ring to a set of units. And I can continue to schemes by just Doing stuff. I could also just restrict to f schemes. schemes. Okay. Maybe we already would have a very defined thing here. Uh, and so one way of being non-smooth is having, as an f scheme, is having nil potents in there. And so GM of Rx mod x squared, that has new potents. Yeah, that's, that's the unit of this thing. <coughs> and in here, for example, we have uh, well, 1 plus epsilon. Yes. Yeah, I should have called it epsilon maybe. It's actually 1 plus epsilon times 1 minus, yes. minus epsilon. That is one uh, plus epsilon squared and minus maybe. That is one. So this is a unit. And it would maybe, maybe not here. not R, but like yeah, I was kind of done writing it. So it's, uh, you mean meant this here? Yeah. Um, okay, but now you are uh, okay. Uh, okay, yeah. And at the bottom, we don't have R star, but R epsilon star. Right. Yeah. This is an R epsilon star. Yeah. Really yeah. And um, what what last equality is just triviality. Yes. <laughs> this one. Last one. Your definition is just an angle. Yeah. You call X epsilon. Yes. Yes. Oh. Yes. Okay. So now I can look at the. Uh, of, uh, I call them this scheme like R epsilon. Uh, I forget what it is, it's called nothing. <laughs> it's cross A1 would just be uh, you know, R epsilon and then one of variable Y. Mm -hmm. This here has another. Uh, Unit one plus epsilon y. Mm. Uh, <coughs> this is our epsilon y star. Because again, I can prove the same trick. Because one plus epsilon y and one minus epsilon y is one minus epsilon squared y is one. Y squared. So that's the thing that is not. So now um, I can look at GM. So I have this, this element in, in GM of R. 
is it the name after all, it's called the scale z. So z cross a1. So this should be an isomorphism if gm was a one invariant on all schemes. Mm -hmm. But it's not because upstairs here I have this one plus epsilon y, and here uh, I have no such thing because there's no epsilon. I uh, know there's no y. So. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So this has no counterpart. Yeah. But all, all limits of here, of course, also appear up there. What that's not the proof, right? What it doesn't what it doesn't have a what it doesn't have a counterpart? Well, um, so I have, I have the units of this of this ring here. Yeah. For example, those. And uh, I have more units upstairs. So all, all of the units here, I can of course... And, and the arrow goes in the other direction, right? Ah, oh, that's maybe... Uh, because we have the projection from z times a1 to z? Yes. Okay, and gm is a contravariant factor on the category of affine schemes. That's true. So covariant factor on the category of rings, okay. Yes. And therefore in that direction. And then we have an, an element in the top, namely 1 plus epsilon y, which is not hit by that morphism. Yeah, yeah, okay. But you wrote an ice morphism. Yeah, I mean, I was supposing, of course, this was one, then I, uh, I find an element which cannot uh, correspond okay. to anything, so I want to aim for the prediction. So this here would be these units, this here would be these units. Mm -hmm. And of any of these units has become just still a unit here because I just enjoyed the variable, but here I have more. Yeah. yeah. So I have an injection which is not surjective. Mm -hmm. So it's not nice, but that is a proof that the GM is not a one in there non smooth schemes. Uh, and, but it is A1 invariant on smooth schemes? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Uh, I mean, that's really the only thing that can go wrong with, uh, with taking units. You, would, you have need near potence, I think. Yeah. In order. Uh, you would need to compare for, for general rings, that's called an S now. You should compare units of this and of this, and the only units. I mean, the ah. only way that new units can appear mm -hmm. here is to right. have some item that new points in S. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay, so that's, I mean, so it would also be true for the new scheme. Yes. So, uh, yeah, as I said, it's a cheap example, <laughs> but it's one that's easy yeah. to see yes. in detail. Yeah. But these other, these cohomology theories will also fail for singular variety, say. That is, the cohomology take a singular variety and ten times it to a one and it will also not be a one invariant. Right, in general. So I mean okay GM is not really uh, should not really be called maybe a commodity theory. But here's a related thing then. There's something called the Picard group. Probably more about it, the scheme. That's uh, I'm bundled on X, and the isomorphism. And we did this essay in exercise, and I apologize to the ones who couldn't come, but so what are line bundles? Well, you move them locally by twisting, well, having locally trivial line bundles, and then twisting the fibers somehow. And that's H1 and GM. This is the group by which I twist. It's the automorphism group of a line bundle. And this is sort of given by mapping X well, into BG as it's something that I get by taking this groupoid of trivial line bundles. Yeah, there's, there's only one trivial line bundle of isomorphism, and it has these automorphisms of GM many. And now uh, I know that GM is not a one invariant, and this okay. This is now a sort of two-stage functor. Yeah, this is like we could have lined on some isomorphisms between them. That's a functor like which has two entries. The lower one is trivial, the upper one is GM. And with GM, we have just seen it's not a one invariant, a non-smooth scheme. So this. Be, 
This can be sort of seen as an indication that the Picard group also is not a one directly non smooth schemes. Maybe you just can also look up an example and actually it's up somewhere. And this really also has to do with singularities, not just with reducedness now. And uh, you will find examples that can be even much more. So, sorry, can you, can you explain again about this GM with the two arrows and the star? So, <laughs> we'll uh, sort of come back to it. It's uh, well, it's, uh, we can see this as a functor in a uh, space. Is it somehow the same thing as senior group as a category? Like, yes. yes. One object in the automorphisms are the group. Yes. Exactly. And all the functor from themes or S to groupoids. Has a scheme with a group point, uh, just one object, and then the NX. Of course, thinking of affine schemes here. And that's a category, well, this is equivalent to the category which has just the trivial line model and all its automorphisms. Of course, that's what you can do. You can multiply things by units, fiber wise. Right? And it's, it's equivalent to what? The point is that. But one has x in it and the other doesn't. Flat bundles over x. Trivial line bundles over x now. And now, if I. I want to hear this, of course, this classifies all the line bundles. Now, if I sheetify this, so I mean just trivial ones. Will not form a sheaf because sheaf means I can say I can check things locally. If I just check something locally in trivial line bundle, then I get the general notion of line bundle, local trivial. So um, it's something that I hinted at yesterday, but I, I, mean, I didn't want this to escalate again <laughs> into a whole sub lecture. So. Um, I sheetify, I get a functor which here, so this x the line bundles on x and isos between them. Well, isos between them, that has just a bunch of connected components. I mean, different line bundles do not have an isomorphism between them. So this is a group point, but I can take the set of isomorphism classes, and that's a Picard group. Mm -hmm. So the Picard group sort of arises by taking this thing, sheetifying, and taking isomorphism classes of in this group right? or connected components if you see it geometrically. And so of this is a, a reason since we have now seen that GM is not a one invariant. And Picardo arises through this process, you can maybe think it's reasonable to see to think uh, that Picardo is also not a one invariant, a non-smooth screen. Mm -hmm. That's what I wanted to hint at. And, but I just suggest you maybe you look at a serious example in the part <laughs> But yeah, that's not a question. Why are there two errors done? Why should that one go up? This year? Yeah. Well, I mean, they're equal because they're not a total object, of course, but that's, uh, what is a group of? It's, it's, a, it's an object of objects, an object of morphisms, has a source and a target map, an identity map, which I didn't draw, and a composition here, which is the group multiplication. It's just a, a fluent part of the structure for having a group point. But of course, source and target are the same in this case. Nothing to be overthinking. Okay, so let's continue uh, our tour through the hexagon a bit, and then I, I this will be more concrete. We have we have some computations, things to actually follow through. But yeah, this, this first step, I mean, in the case of topology, we, all we did was inverting projections. Here we did a few more things. We co-completed, we, uh, but we co-completed in, in a way which preserved the, the existing geometric push-outs and gluing data that we had. That's, that's just preserving the risky 
at this image, and as I said, I don't talk about today. And you do all the steps at once, just to obtain a just for the nice shape and for the for the not an octagon. Yes. So sort of yeah. So the completion was not necessary in the case of topology space. They already were co complete and not fit for fun. The actual, the real uh, analogy would be to just start with the one point category. And if I co complete that, then I get spaces. But that's a bit <laughs> okay. So next thing. So this this is what is called. Spaces over S. You always have to carry around the space key, but I stopped right now doing that. Oh, maybe not, not yet. Okay. Uh, for more details, go to this abelian category. Abelian category is a zero object, therefore are pointed, so we can go to pointed spaces instead. So I'm adding an official base point. Then in here we have two objects. We have um, S1. This is mod spaces star, right? A oh, mod space, thank you. <laughs> so we have a copy of the topological circle. You can see it like this. I mean, this is functors to spaces, and I can just have the constant functor, which always spits out the value as one. You can always you can also see it like this. Uh, I certainly have a point in here. I have it imported from there already, and I can take a point cooperate with point and co-complete, right? And take the that's s zero two points. You take the push out along to further points, that's the suspension, and the outcome is S1. In any way, I, I have S1 in here, and, any, and I actually have all homotopy types in this way because they already live here as constant functors from schemes. Right? So, this is a place where I can import schemes from here. Those sort of first, before uh, inverting this, live here as as a set value functor, which take values just in set, discrete spaces if you want. And I also, I also have spaces here which do not care what scheme I put into it, constant functors. These are sort of orthogonal mm. subsets in here. Mm -hmm. We will see uh, in a minute <coughs> that, they, that these two worlds mix up once I localize here, I set the computation. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we have, we have certain here as one. And we have GM. In both cases, I mean uh, pointed space. Yeah, I, I just <coughs> used something in front of S1, no, the left one. And I choose, well, GM is a, is a group object. I have the neutral element in there, the one. I choose that as a base point here. Because I have to have to paper to know what I mean by smashing. Mm -hmm. uh, this mesh product here. So these are two endo functors. And now the next uh, next observation is <coughs> that our, our homology theories uh, they turn these endo functors here into auto equivalences of our target categories. As before, this S1 just means a shift. These, these typically have at least one grading, actually they're, they're typically bi-graded now. And this S1 smashing just shifts the grading, it's an impossible thing to do, it can go backwards, it's the same motivation as for topological spaces. This is one thing we can convert and it's pointing brackets for that, so that functor to be inverted. And now there's the smashing with GM, it also becomes an inverted operation, these target categories. What kind of operation? So, maybe I should write more than I do. Um, So 
this becomes a Doppler operation, it's under cohomology. So the GM is a more subtle thing. So typically these, these cohomology theories don't land just in abelian groups or sequences of abelian groups. They have some more structure. For example, the tile cohomology uh, sends, sends your, your scheme to Galois for the stations. So if I have a base field here, this field will have a Galois group, and the Galois group will act on the on the on the cohomology, which is an important thing. It's a major source of color representations, actually. So this abelian category is really some category of group <coughs> representations. Or a drag around cohomology it comes then with the with the Hodge structure. So this lands in the category of Hodge, Hodge structure, which is uh, these groups uh, additionally have some filtration. And this GM Smashing in the case, for example, of Galois representations, it leaves the group the same, but it twists the representation. Now the Galois group will act differently on it. That's something you can undo. And so this this uh, change of representation is, is given by tensoring with an invertible Galois module, and you can just tensor with the with the dual of that module, and then you've undone it. And in the case of the Hodge structures, you have this filtration. Uh, smashing with GM will shift the filtration, and you can just shift it back. So, so I've heard about this object and motivic fundamental group. Does yes. this act on all these things? How does it appear? Ah, not, yeah, <laughs> not yet at all. Okay. It's a, it's a different story. Okay, not really with that. Sure. But yeah, it has to do with all these extra structures, absolutely. On a, on a, it's a dollar Yeah. Uh, the space that is a compact set, or do you use a mixed dollar No, mixed constant. Just filtrations. So, I mean, that's just the motivation to, to invert the special with GM. Yeah? It's, it's, in practice, it also becomes something invertible and like a homology. That's all I wanted to say. And then this, these are the different structures that we have there that, that we twist and Look at and actually these twists are important and we want to keep track of them. So but yeah, we can invert that one too. And um, well last time I, I told you that you can there is this uh, initial functor among all functors which invert these endo functors. Uh, we actually did this in the in the setting of presentable categories and left adjoins. Uh, we now, we, we still do this now, and well, it's, we could also do it in the world of presentable monoidal categories and left adjoints. Or more, more accurately, presentably monoidal, <laughs> meaning that if you fix one object in your tensor product, then the other side will be a, a left adjoint. Like and so, yeah, we can take, we can take care, like by construction, that this again will be a monoidal category with a smash program, as people would sort of like it to have. This actually happens automatically in the, in the case of, of schemes, but later on in my setting it will no longer. But anyway, it's the same construction. We do this co limit, uh, and yeah, take care that we in the, in the end we just do it in the, in the right world. So in this case, in the end, we get again a. The metric monoidal presentable category and this part of the event. So now I should mark what I'm going here maybe in my part. I will want to withdraw the lecture, it's too stressful, but so this is like multiphic spectrum. And this is exactly multiphic spectrum. Okay, now let's uh, well, write down the word multiphic spectrum. Let's do a little. So first, you take the co-limit of smashing with this one, smashing with this one, and blah blah blah, and then with the GM or. No, I would rather mix the two. Or yes. <coughs> you can you mix this. So all finite subsets of, of S ones and GMs, uh, and then smash like mix them widely, smash all of them. Or we do the following, and that's actually more. Uh, 
and convenient to see. Um, as to the computation, as I told you, we are we have space and we have schemes coming sort of from the orthogonal sides mm -hmm. into this world of computing spaces. Mm -hmm. And we can do a little computation here. So we have uh, we have this here. Well, this is the suspension of GM, whatever that may be. Yeah? It's something I have, I have. This is a a scheme. So it's a, it's a functor taking values in discrete spaces at first. And I can mm -hmm. suspend it so this becomes S1 smash GM. Yeah? Suspension is smashing with S1. But I have a, a weekly equivalent diagram. Maybe this here. Yeah? In this world, if I set x to equal to the point, then I see that a1 equivalent to the point, because now this is going to be equivalent. So this is an equivalent diagram. And if I do this push out, and let's uh, maybe be accurate here, so I first invert, and then go to a1. And this is exactly what you know how to do a uh, projective space, projective line. Yeah, you sort of have two copies of A1, but you sort of twist the, the common copy of GM when you, when you pass from one side to the other side. Mm -hmm. Well, this, this to the minus one wouldn't have, wouldn't, wouldn't really uh, be necessary in this world because anyway, this is a map to terminal object, and that's what you want up to. Uh -huh. You can kind of change the map any way you want it, is that point? Well, if it goes to a point, yes, you can <laughs> present it in, in schemes. Do any way you want it. <laughs> uh -huh. So this, is, so this is push out. Oh, it's it's out of work. Yeah, which just becomes just a suspension. This here uh, is push out in schemes, and it remains a push out in here because we did the risky justification. Yes. That means that push outs imported from here stay push outs here. Mm -hmm. and now, yeah, we have two push outs of equivalent values. So this here. Not, not arbitrary push-outs um, remain, right? But push-outs made up using open immersions. Right. The put, yeah. and that's that's set to push-out. Yes. Yeah. So now we have an equivalence here. Uh -huh. And this one is, is actually, again, a scheme. It's something important from here, right? So it can be represented by a functor that takes values just in sets, in discrete spaces. The other one is visibly not as a one cell. So this distinction of our two worlds that we can import sort of gets blurred once we import it, uh, we contract A1. Yeah. And, and, and this is, if, if you look homotopically over C, then GM is like a circle, homotopic to a circle. Absolutely. It's a, it's, a, yeah, it's a very good idea to always check the geometric intuition by searching complex points. Uh -huh. Not real points, then it's more difficult. Take complex points, so what? Uh, so suppose our, our base scheme is, is complex numbers. That's a constant sanity check that you can always do. So what you then get here, then we get topological spaces actually, if you take the analytic topology on this, on these complex points. Yeah. We get here, well, what is uh, GM of C, it's, it's the units in C, C star. Yeah. And on the other side, we get uh, CP1. Well, what is CP1? That's the two sphere. Yes. That's, uh, it's C2 modulo uh, complex multiplication by, by C star, so we can shrink first everything uh, down to, to uh, modulus 1, to, to actual value 1. That's an, an S2, and then you, uh, no, that's an uh, S3, and then you can rotate around by complex multiplication and end up with an S2. It's simply the Riemann, Riemann sphere. Right? Yes. Yeah. And here C star, what is that? Well, it's the, it's the complex plane without zero. It's almost equivalent to just the circle because you can drink everything to absolute value one. Mm -hmm. So this is really actually S1 smash S1. Yeah. And that's of course the same as 
has to. So really, I mean, that's the sanity check. Upon inserting complex points, this uh, equivalence is true. And actually, you can do it the other way around. You can prove it in this motivic world, and then you can deduce that after inserting complex points, there's a functor to the, to the topological world. This must be true. Uh -huh. That's, of course, here it's completely overkill. I mean, but uh, people have done this successfully. They, they have been computing uh, new stable homotopy groups of spheres and topology by doing things in the utility world and then applying mm -hmm. these points. Wow. Mm -hmm. okay. So what, what has been, what, what stem, like what did they actually compute? Do you know? Oh, I think before they knew up to 63, and now they went up to 90 something. It's really substantial. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, Walter Isaacson, Rest uh, Behren, Dick Spitzbeck. I don't know, a bunch of people. Uh, I'm forgetting the younger ones, it's not just uh, Achim Krause is there, um, Gohan Bogdan. Oh, really? A bunch of people. So it's just, and this is just the stable of the groups for any brand? Or... For no, yeah. Uh, or unstable even? No, no, stable. Stable. But no primes, no, no, no. no primes. Okay. Okay, so that's the kind of thing that can happen here in this in this world. Yeah, so the, the spaces and the schemes get blurred and then sometimes identified. Both aspects are part of the same world now. Okay, why did I do exactly this computation, the sample computation? Because well, we invert the session with S1 and session with GM. You can as well. Inverse <coughs> smashing with S1 smash GM. Right? You know, if we want to uh, go down just one S1 copy, then we can go down one copy of S1 and one copy of GM and then smash up with GM again. So, and this is so, in the end, we can as well just invert smashing with P1 and now we are back to a maybe more comfortable feeling mm -hmm. thing. We just invert smashing with one single object. Mm -hmm. And now all this to expect run. Yeah, maybe so I, I give you a few more uh, hints and on when to expect such phenomena when, when uh, schemes suddenly become become spaces of higher dimensions which have higher cells when not. So some schemes really embed in here and stay themselves if you want. Uh, so so Yes. Does GM have trivial momentum, or is, is, can you can try to compute the common topic group of GM? Yes. Is that is that really difficult or known or trivial? It's known and it's difficult and it's, it's a great uh, result if you are over a field. I mean, it's a, well, it's known over a field. The outcome relates to the quadratic form theory over that field. It's sort of uh -huh. it's the golden bit group, the Milner K theory group. And it's, it's a mixture of both of these. But I, I hope to say this. I mean, if not, I say it's an exercise class. And, and P1? P1? Ah, it's just a shift. It's a shift because okay. P1 is S1 smash GM. Yeah, okay. S1 shifts the. Hmm. You have another question back there? Hmm? I thought it's, it's still worried about the same amount of conversation. It's uh, just shifts. Uh, well, you can see this here as the, well, we have, we have the sheaves, and then we can take the subcategory of A1 invariant sheaves, those sheaves which turn these projections into isomorphisms. Mm -hmm. okay, and what is the functor? Okay. This functor, yeah. well, it's, you can show it's a reflective subcategory, and there's the reflection functor. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. 
Uh, not, not this, but uh, sorry, from. So maybe we should zoom in. Uh, we have spaces to the smooth scaling up. We have, we have the subcategory of the risky sheets. Uh, you also have another subcategory of A1 and variant sheet you want. And that's what we are thinking about, I think, that these two concepts can be looked at uh, separately. And if you try to go here and now make it uh, the risk now the risk is file, you're not necessarily still there. If you, did, if you go here, then forget that you was were here and go back up and the risk sheet file didn't stay the one there. That's that's what you're troubled by. It's true. But you can just complete the square and take take both things. Uh, so upstairs is the inclusion. So these this is what it is based. So it's better. It's an intersection of subcategories. Ah, okay. So these are the uh, these are the sheaves which are the uh, the three sheaves which are the risky sheaves and uh, really this label to practice. Uh, and which are in one very so if, you, if you just write down any sheet, you can ask whether you're already here. If not, you have to go there somehow. And yeah, if you, if you do it in a model category way or something, then you uh, all you can do is go here, then go back up, then go here, then go back up, and then do it infinitely many times, and you can then move after an infinite transparent proposition of these processes, you are actually here now. But yeah, I mean. I just I just stated this fact now that this is a reflexive subcategory of that and we can go here. So So when is a can I ask when is a scheme you need to embed it into here already there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Precisely, if, if uh, mapping into that scheme is answer <coughs> so those schemes which are uh, such that mapping them is uh, yeah. are the risky chief. That's always true. Which are well, which are really present a functor which is just which the risky sheet. So that's not a condition. Yeah. <coughs> and I want rigid. So that means the functor represented by them really has this property of uh, having such projections or isomorphisms. For example, the M is not a one limit that you've seen. And no, it is, it is because we have presented the yes. smooth. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay. 
is the definition of a one application? Uh, I have a special ID and then say it. it means exactly mapping these projections to isomorphisms. So those schemes, let's call them Y, home playing Y in schemes. Uh, of S. S. Maps these projections twice more. Local objects for that. Yes. Sorry? The local objects. Yes, that's also local objects for a box of localization. This tells you something. So, um, here's another example. Like the curves of genus bigger than zero are one rigid. Why? Because, um, let's call it C, such a curve. I'll just give a hint, I don't need proof. I mean, if I have a map, from A1 to this curve C, then it should, it should, be, it should be the same as points. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I have to put it away. Such maps, uh, since this curve is projective, they will always factor through the inclusion to A1. Mm -hmm. But there is no such map because this has genus 0, and there are no maps from genus 0 to higher genus mm -hmm. curves. Mm -hmm. yeah? I mean, the genus is really number of holes and P1 is sort of a sphere as we have seen and you cannot map the sphere to this thing of holes. Mm -hmm. And so sort of there are no non-trivial maps, no non-constant maps from A1 to C and that's sort of an indication why this projection business is okay. Um, P1 is of course not A1 rigid because we do have, after all, the, this long term inclusion to P1. Because it's not constant. And. Yeah, so that's, so that's a bit weird. Because first we saw that if you take GM and you suspend it, then it becomes P1. So GM is A1 rigid, I suspect that I get something which is not A1 rigid. Yeah, I mean GM sort of, I think of it like this space itself in here, it's just uh, the, the GM scene as a, as a functor to yeah. spaces, to in this case discrete yeah. spaces, is already a good representative in this category. Yeah. Well, so that's while the functor of maps to P1 is not. So yeah. P1 gets more from something else. And Right. So Why else can be higher cells in the, in the space direction? And GM already very good shape if we just leave it at that. But this A1 localization is not, uh, doesn't give you a map of topoid, right? No. So this, this thing here is maybe a good thing to say anyway. Things to come. Uh, so this, this, and there are trees. This one here is a topos. Yeah. Uh, but this one is not. This one is also not. It is, however, a Cartesian closed category. So we have this a topos is, is, a, is a reflective subcategory of a pre shift category, such that the reflection functor deserves finite limits. A Cartesian closed presentable category is exactly a reflective subcategory of a pre shift category, such that the reflection functor preserves finite products. This is still the case pretty much by construction because we, these things are close to the closer. Uh, yeah, but, but it's not a control, it's on top of because certain cubes stop being in this Sorry, can you expand again from the projected curve? Like this property, why this follows that C is a Um. Well, 
I mean, uh, so one, one test case would be if maps from A1 to C are the same as maps from a point to C. If all maps from A1 are constant. And they have to be because, the, I mean, maps from A1 to a subjective curve can always be continued to, to something to the projected closure sort of with P1. But there are no non constant maps from P1 to C. So um, now the same applies as before that we all of that uh, the ability theorem for, for the pointers we're interested in, and they're representable by objects here in this motivic spectra. So we have something called the Eigenberg plane spectrum with all kinds of coefficients and later on we more look at the ones with rational coefficients. Uh, we have a nice bright heat here spectrum. We have this uh, complex uh, cobaltism, uh, well, no, algebraic cobaltism spectrum. What's the name again? I forgot. Well, MU? Well, in topology, yes, but. MO. No. <laughs> M. That's too much, whatever. Also, nothing that I was aiming for in this lecture. <laughs> so, again, we have uh, spectra representing our commodity theories. Uh, for some commodity theories, we have cup products, which will uh, induce a multiplication up here in the commodity groups. And these often come from ring structures on the spectra, and again, we can form uh, modules of the spectrum. In the case of, of the motivic commodity spectrum, uh, three module map. Get here it's called motives. Let's always carry on the space key maybe for now. And well, while in the case of topology, I remind you. This was simply now the derived category of the groups, so you are already pretty close to having something only algebraic. And it's, it's rather simple. In the case of Q, this would be just graded Q vector spaces. Uh, here, this is not at all easy. It's a complicated category, which is hard to understand and, and has produced lots of advances in different fields. It's also very useful. But so this is now the place where all the, these ordinary commodity theories take the proof. Roughly, you can say this HZ, which represents motivic commodity, which, which are these higher Chow groups. So, this commodity theory is made up of, out of cycles on our schemes. And roughly, what factors through here are exactly those commodity theories which have cycle maps. Where you can take cycles on your scheme, closed sub schemes, that produce a commodity class. That's how you know it in, in topology, right? You, singular homology is also built out of sub spaces of your space. And these classical commodity theories, that's what you should always do. Okay, well, you always have these cycle maps. Not, it's it's a, also a standard question whether all commodity clubs come from these cycle maps or like how many come if, it, if they are subjective enough. Lots of open projectors around this. Uh, but, but yeah, those commodity theories with cycle maps are what factors through here and which is being studied in this setting. This is yeah, pretty algebraic. This is also sort of algebraic. This is un unalgebraic still. And that's the last part of this hexagon. So, time for a break now. And after the break, we get a bit more <laughs> abstract, but then also more concrete. <laughs> I want to not insist so much on the algebraic geometry then. I have an abstract setting. 
uh, where we started with some good enough category here and some group object and, and repeat these construction steps, and we can do some concrete calculations with those. So maybe then it gets more touchable. And still, uh, these are include uh, valid proofs of topological facts and of facts brought into the group theory and on many other settings as well. So let's have a break. Okay, let's go on for the second half of the morning session. So now, to abstract into the content theory, that's meaning I, I drop some of the concrete inputs here and can still do stuff that you do in usual to the content theory. Uh, and my starting point is the following. I don't have to know now these commodities, I don't have to know what the scheme is. Uh, my starting point is this here. I, I start with, a, with some good enough category C, infinity category C, and then go on constructing stuff from there. This will include the schemes, the case of the space and some others. So, so the C is um, continuum closed. Close means I, I have uh, right advice to the, the taking product with this fixed object, object. So, as I said, I mentioned before that this is not a topos, but it's a Cartesian closed such an infinity category. It's a reflective subcategory of previous topos with a pro finite product preserving reflection function. It's exactly another characterization of such things. And we need one other thing. For what I'm going to do. Uh, well, obviously, we need something like GM to, to carry out this stabilization process. So I give myself a commutative group object. In my C. That's something now axiomatically given. The, the, we don't even assume that we have such a thing here. We just start at the spaces and we think of this important GM in here. Okay, uh, examples before we do anything with this. So uh, maybe uh, Mark, because I know that some of you actually know about one categories, and that's maybe a more comfortable way of saying it for those people. So we can <coughs> always present such a C by a, a by a Cartesian combinatorial model category. But that's just now. This others can stop taking notes. <coughs> um, Cartesian means monoidal for the product monoidal structure. And a group like E infinity algebra in there, this operator. A way presenting this in the model category language. That's where I can start. Because this upstairs the group is really commutative. It's not. No. Infinity means up to all high homotopies and so on. And in the infinity category land, I always have, have 
derived and, and uh, yeah, but commutative is defined as yes. Is it well? There's this phenomenon that sometimes you only have to like make it loops once, right? I think. Yeah. Well, commutative is. I mean, I would define it as an algebra for a Lorwell theory. Yeah. Actually, I will define it in one of my examples. What it means, you will see. And it will be strict, but no. Not set. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's not strict. It's it's in the infinity categorical world. So this is exactly okay. what I mean. This is an infinity algebra. It just has to be up to higher on to answer the associative of higher on. Okay. Um, that's the hexagon. You all have one on your, on your nose, I guess. Go through a bunch of examples, and maybe some of these are more comfortable for you than the ski business. So, examples are, of course, homological spaces, so they should be, and book objects should be S1 the sphere with complex multiplication. And it has to be a group object, but well, it's the unit complex numbers. Mm -hmm. And if we do this, then we have just a methodological set. Yeah? We, have, we have a sphere, we later on invert these two spheres, we invert as one, and we invert, well, that G is it's inverting as one again, we didn't do anything. We get spectra, and we get standard constructions. Uh, of course, That's the thing I'm, I'm abstracting is multiplic spaces over some base scheme and you need a multiplicative group or more accurately the Yoneda composite multiplicative group. Mm -hmm. Then there's there's a bunch of other settings where this where this whole thing makes sense. I mean. Geometry takes takes many forms. So we can always take you know, instead of schemes, take analytic spaces, for example, or uh, you know, either either complex analytic or appropriate spaces or something like this. Then we can take the, the Corresponding geometric objects, then again, we do meta embedding to co complete those, uh, localized by some appropriate topology for those, or however you do these things, and uh, contract A1. There's always something like an F9 here also. Uh, oh, there's derived of spectral. Geometry, and this has been studied, the mutilic setup, setup for, for derived schemes, whatever that may be. If you don't know, don't worry. There's, for example, block schemes. It's like schemes, but your structure sheet has another map from some monoid, which gives you extra data about similarities somehow. And things uh, have less trouble being smooth in block geometry than another. And usual algebraic geometry. It's something that you can throw in here. Possibly tropical geometry. But I didn't try how much sense it makes, but I do. You could just throw in C infinity manifolds. So all of these are examples of read spaces. All these geometric objects. And we can take G to be the units of this structure sheaf, which is a ring. Hmm. 
So what would be, I mean, top is not green, right? Top? Top is not green. Uh, uh, well, you can, no. no. So G is S1, S1 doesn't arise as the unit. In the topological setting, no. This, this G really becomes only a, an object of its, of its own if you have some geometry there. Yeah. Well, although, yeah, yeah, there are other examples. So my own motivating example was one geometry, mm. which is something you are very much invited to ask me about in some exercise session. And that's actually the reason for the, for the slightly insane generality that I chose. <laughs> Uh, to just have this GM as a starting point. If I had a few things more, I could do much more in my abstract setup, but I don't have them in the form geometry. I do not have something like a GLM, because mm -hmm. it involves addition and you don't have addition. Mm -hmm. But it's replication with this uh -huh. There's no addition in form geometry, so uh -huh. unfortunately I don't have GLMs, just some fake approximation. Huh. So, no. Um, and here, okay, F1 geometry. Well, it's, there's the story about this. There's, 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 a, there's a myth of this beautiful element, and it should be a deeper base, deeper than, than spec Z for algebraic geometry. And you can ask what is defined over F1 even, and, and not just over spec Z. Well, and everybody agrees that GM is defined over F1, and so we take the usual GM there. Okay. So what is F? F1? For <laughs> you, the prices, not uh, But here's another one. Example. So, back to topology, you can take topological space with a Z2 action. That's, that's the thing that is considered in practice. So, yeah, so C would be the two top, uh, the space with the two action and the two equivalent continuous mass between them. Uh, equivalences would be just yeah, those which have underlying, uh, the underlying continuous maps are equivalences. And G would be uh, <coughs> S1, again, with the star multiplication. And now we need a the two action, and that would be conjugation. That is comfortable with the group uh, structure on this S1. And here uh, is the, well, no, that's five. So there's a universal example for this whole setup. Mm -hmm. I'd be nice to say this in such a topos friendly environment. Yeah. It's heavily inspired the topos theory and last one uh, That would be the following. I take the field category of spaces and I take the category of pre sheets on the finally generated free E infinity algebras in top. Uh huh. What is that? I mean, uh, group like, sorry. So it's, this is sort of the universal Cartesian closed presentable infinity category containing a cumulative group object. Yeah. Every every other um, C prime with a commutative group object G in there receives a functa. So to admit which one this is, um, this the C is an is an object of the category of this goes to the infinity one categories and final product preserving left adjoints. Mm -hmm. So that's the wrong way if you think of metamorphisms. Just like. So is this 
be would this be the classifying topos for a commuted group object? Commuted groups. Well, it's not topo, but why is it? Okay, no, this is topos. I mean, it doesn't work just for toposes, and sure, it works more generally. But works more generally, and so because I only need finite code preserving to transport this mm -hmm. to other places. But this is yeah. I mean. It would be the class time tokens, then I would have to complete this under finite limits, but I'm just taking the log theory here. Mm -hmm. This is just finite general free in the algebra, so not yeah. Yeah. Uh, So it doesn't give you the right answer. It doesn't give you the. No, theory. so uh, geometric models out of this would classify the other would classify the geometric theory of free mm -hmm. uh, right. okay. groups. Okay. Mm -hmm. But if I just look at this. When a product preserving after joins them, should be the right thing. Yeah, so there, there's a universal, there's a group object in here, which is just forget what function. And this group object, well, if any other such, such uh, example here, this group object will map to that one. And, and I could, what, I, what I'm going to do, I could just do for this particular example, because all I'm Doing will be functorial, then I could transfer my results to, to all the other places. Right? Mm -hmm. But I don't do it. So, this sort of is an answer to when you were asking what is the community food object. <laughs> mm -hmm. it's, it's a, I mean, you know how class pack offices work, you know, I have the, this whole thing, whatever. I'll repeat it now, and I have the Yoneda embedding here, and which is of course finite product preserving, and so a uh, commutative group object in some of these categories is just a uh, finite product preserving functor from, from this little category. Let's let's take this with right. That's a law theory kind of Okay, now the way with this. So now the question is yeah, I just delete it all. What can we do in this very general setup? All that we are getting given now is GM. Doesn't sound like we have much geometry available. So what can we construct uh, with GM? So let's start. Let's start working in all different categories C using this GM. Just that. That's that would be the unstable to the complexity for spaces. You should be thinking of. So what something we can be could be constructing as the following. Remember, um, these schemes a n without zero that I defined last time. So I'll write a three without zero this time. <coughs> so. It was it was uh, well, sort of given by saying you want the three couples of elements of our ring to insert a ring such that one of them is a uh, at least possibly all and this could be glued together by from affine schemes by by now a cubical diagram. Mm -hmm. and so in, in schemes we should think of these trees as GM. I just don't write it now. Um, and then gradually you can replace more of these entries by a once, and that would be here, and these two commonly map to a so one. Of, some of the cheese has an M and some don't. Is this an accident? Oh. Or yes, it's an accident. Thank you. Yeah. 
Here's another layer in the back that would be the plus A1 plus A1. This is all. Yes. So we put all of this, oh, the colon of this. Well, generally, I have a, a, a n dimensional hypercube to glue together a n without one, a without zero, sorry. <laughs> and another observation about this. Schemes of, uh, where with this G3 GM, all these maps are, well, A1 only makes sense in schemes, I mean. Oh, G you have a G, G action on every place here, acting diagonally, we are in, or by multiplication on each factor. I mean, I can multiply any ring element with, with units and, of course, the units with units. And these include, of course, respect to multiplication, right? So this whole push out happens actually in, in uh, objects with a G action, and then I have an action to be back here still. So, in motelic spaces, by a fine line to a point. So we could just the product with a point is nothing, do with a terminal object, right? I mean <laughs> right rather one. It's, that's the thing now, it's a terminal object, and product of the terminal object doesn't change anything, so I can really uh, There's category of fine people here. What I actually do is I take the arrow category. The arrow category is this whole set. That's this one here. With the uh, supremum, uh, it's a monoidal category. Mm -hmm. And so I take the day convolution product on this. This is also monoidal with the product. And then the map. The n without zero to the terminal object is the n fold day convolution product uh -huh. of this. That's technically very convenient, actually, in mm -hmm. some arguments. Mm -hmm. But this was just. Okay, so now we uh, could actually define uh, these punctured affine spaces, but yeah, take care, we define this as a coordinate. Such a hypercube in G objects. Yeah, uh, that's uh, well, objects in C of the G action. And Maps. I still want a G action on this, on this outcome here, and I just take care of having that by, by defining the whole thing in G objects. <laughs> <coughs> 
my node, but it doesn't change the outcome in the, in the motivating setting. It didn't work, that's exactly what you get. What happens if we compute it not in the category with G actions, but in the original category? So in, uh, in our Fanta actually preserves yeah. uh, the whole limits, I think. Yeah, okay. So we would get the same underlying option, but I do want to use ah, the you want, Okay, sure, I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, why does it exist in the limit? See, well, I thought it was a presentable, uh, is it? Uh, the presentable is code. Yeah, that's what my high definition presentable means every object is a code limit of a set of. Yeah, that, that, that alone would not yet help us, help you, but <laughs> that alone would not yet help you. Yeah, Just the biggest part of the definition, actually. Yeah. yeah. But uh, you can equally define it as well, my, my standard setting where I start as a ref Reflective subcategory or appreciative category with a product, a finite product preserving reflection functor. And reflective subcategories and appreciative categories are definitely co Okay, so that's, that's the definition. It's construction we have. It's already a bunch of, of sort of geometric objects without starting from more than, a, than, than this GM substitute. And well, we have inclusions. Let's put some maps now. Uh, from the these punch up, I find spaces <coughs> with the dimensions, which come from taking the co limit just along one side of this of this cube here. So. I just draw what I mean by this. <coughs> so what do I mean? Um, following this. like this, where do they come from? Um, so this is sort of the front face of this cube here. Yeah, here I only have one G, G copy, that's this one. And I take uh, co-limits along all the, all the other data already. So what I do together here, so I look here uh, at all the places where the middle G is still present, right? That's, mm -hmm. that's all the case in all of these diagrams. So if G cross, the middle G cross a diagram which glues together uh, exactly A n minus 1, or in this case A2 without 0. And since we have a petition closed category, this G cross computes with co-limits, and I take this partial co-limit, I, I get this. Mm -hmm. Then, well, I mean, also it just makes sense uh, if you think of what, of what this means. Yeah, these are the n tuples of elements, or at least one of which is a unit. So either I have uh, n minus one, uh, <coughs> some choice of n minus one elements a unit, or the other one is a unit. And then you can mm -hmm. double possibility. Yeah. But this gives us these uh, inclusion maps. And I can, of course, choose any coordinate for this, so I have a bunch of inclusion maps. I don't know, okay, but they turn off the equivalent anyway. Um, okay. Yes, 
still space for one definition here. So we want to construct sort of geometric things from this. We of course just define now um, n to be a n plus one plus zero module g. We have the g actually here and we can define the right. space. This also explains why you wanted the g action. Yes. And in the case of F1 geometry, you obtain what's usually called Pn in the F1 land. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. So now uh, I'll go through a series of lemmas. To show, to show one thing. The aim is to construct a classifying space for line bundles. It's also already something non-trivial geometric. So here's a, a completely categorical lemma. I'll write down one category and there's no trouble generalizing it. <coughs> so if I have bunch of morphisms in my category. This one starting at the terminal object, it's a point. And a commutative diagram like this, C cross X, cross should be smaller than. Uh, I can project this to Z, I can project this to X, and I can use F and G is equal to Y. Then G is constant. Then this effect is through a point. So far, and why is it true? Well, we take our this diagram that we are given, there's an X, uh, and we enhance it with a few things so we can go through. point of x. We can come from here for that. We have uh, again the projection to that. We can again come from here with the and of course the points are pretty good to do all of this, but uh, you can convince yourself that the outer thing is identity. And here we can Project to X again and go through the point. Mm -hmm. Everything commutes here, as you could check. And well, this one is G, this one goes through the point. Yeah. So this holds in any category. In absolutely any category, which... any infinity category. Yes, yeah. yeah. But it's enough to check this in the category whether something goes through the point. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this, I didn't say anything about push out or something commutative. This yes. Means up to I have words in the infinity category and it boils down to commutative and optical category. Mm -hmm. Okay. What is the condition one to x? Or what is but we have a point. I, I, given, given three morphisms and a commutative diagram like this, I conclude that the map G is constant. Yeah. But what is 1 to x? It's what is from terminal object to x. From terminal. Okay. I just need some point. Uh, it doesn't even occur here. That's maybe what's confusing. Yeah? I have to be able to map through this 
I thought if one is the initial object, then this is no condition. So you know, tell yeah, me every morphism is somehow constant. Always tell me. I don't believe that. Yeah. Yeah. So you know there are objects without points, no real objects. So that's that's it's what's in my opinion. That's, that's all. Yeah. Uh, okay, so corollary uh, is included that we have our constant. Okay, so I'm convinced by the proof, but uh, my my intuition feels violated right now, oh, okay. because like uh, usually that is not a constant map, right? No, but in yeah. homotopy theory it is. Okay. It's homotopic to a constant map. Yeah. Okay. How come? Oh, yeah, maybe we should check this in, in topology. Um, Check with topology, we can always perform as certain complex points here. Yeah. I think in this case, real points would be fine as well, but okay, whatever. Mm -hmm. This map then is. Uh, I take y, x, 1 to x, and then minus 1. And I insert 0 in the, in the end. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter, the non zero element is somewhere in front already. Yes. And this should be on the topic to what I get by putting a one in the end and uh -huh. zeros everywhere else. Okay. And how so? I simply take a convex combination, right? Exactly. Yeah. For an extra parameter t, so I can really write down a homotopy now. The yes. The ball is t. I just take uh, this times x1, this times n minus 1, comma t. Yes. Yeah, so this comma t gets mapped to this couple, and that's the homotopy, which never is yeah. entirely zero. Yeah, for no yes. t in the middle. I have to check that I've always had in this space here. Yeah. But yeah, either either this one is non-zero, uh, or when it's zero, then then I'm in point and I know that one of these is non-zero. Yeah, and that would also hold constructively, because we know that uh, for any t t or one minus t is invertible. Absolutely, that is also actually a, a valid proof in multiple complex theory uh -huh. because there is a local ring. Nice. Yeah. Right. Everything is. Yes. Either t or one minus t in a local ring is always yeah. non-zero. Yeah. We are really actually. Yeah. And um, so that is a proof, but it would not apply uh, in my in my f one geometry. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I have to come up. With it. And also, I mean, oh, we know in f one geometry. I, I, yeah, I don't have this minus here. I cannot do yeah. convex combination. I could still hook up somehow something like a homotopy because I have a simplicial dimension and some in some model category setup if I want. But in that generality, I mean, I, I have trouble saying mm -hmm. homotopy at all, so I have to find an argument. Yeah. But this is also an example of how you can reason in infinity categories right away without point set presentations of things. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, just a short follow-up question. Um, so, uh, so where in that proof of ours did we use that we are already in the homotopy category? Like in the, at that diagram, I would believe yeah. that this diagram already commutes on the level of schemes. This year? Yeah. Yes, it does. Okay, but then we could apply that very general lemma on the level of schemes and obtain that already on the level of schemes that morphism is constant. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Same question. You're right. <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> what went wrong here? Yeah, you attentive. <laughs> yeah, I suppose we continue now and have a nice exercise. Absolutely, exercise. What key is at the bottom mark? This one here? Yes. Yeah. It, uh, yeah. Mm. Takes an axiom and inserts it at the back. And the yes. Yeah. On position, for example. Yeah. We take for f and the edit. So we use, and I have a map from the terminal and the group to set. And the event is not constant. I am y converts at the level of schemes. Aha, uh -huh, it doesn't it does. probably. Um, well, it doesn't, of course, I protected away this thing as a canyon. Yeah, it does. Yes, it doesn't. Okay, good. Exercise Thank solved. Exercise solved. Can you tell me my mistake? I'm, I'm lazy to think about uh, myself. <laughs> Category of groups Z, X, and Y are the integers. F and G are the identity. Are the integers? Yeah. Ah, the group of integers. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> F and G are the identity. Okay. Your proof shows me the identity is constant, right? Oh my god, it's my level. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Why does it? So F and G is identity, and then? Yeah. And, uh, and all groups involved are, are uh, the integers, okay? Why not? But, but it doesn't commute. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah it doesn't commute. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Because if you have a pair, yeah, 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 yeah. the components need to be equal. <laughs> Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but then, 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 hold up. Yeah. <laughs> then of course I have a further follow-up because maybe we, we stop having follow-up because it's not. But okay. um, why does that uh, diagram commute in um, in the homotopy category? In the category, we are, see, we are all actually working in because if we really do. Yeah. I mean, it's here an a1 and there an a n minus 1. Yeah, okay. We include these things here. That's a strictly commutative thing. Uh -huh. Now okay. we can, here, the, that's the space where we can deform wildly as we want. Okay. For example, to zero. Yes, okay. Or this direction to, to zero in the second. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Very nice. Okay. Uh, do you remember when proof stands, I think? We have these option maps. And another corollary. <laughs> Namely, uh, can form a infinity without zero. What is that? It's the co-limit of the, all these embeddings here. Mm -hmm. Start at some n. So we have a co-final subdiagram system of models. We take code of this now. 
equal to the that one is equal to the whole thing, equal to the bottom, because these are confined sub diagrams. Nice, yeah. That's that. And that actually gives the theorem. Now, um, find P infinity. What's that? That's the co limit. Uh, I didn't, didn't define the embeddings of protective spaces. Might be an interesting exercise. Might be, but it's, no, let's not keep it mysterious now. Yeah. Uh, let's leave this again. We have these embeddings that are defined by. And we can just divide off the GM edge. Okay. So these are embeddings which, which add a zero at some coordinate. Of this, right? And so this is what I want to define. At P infinity, I take the column of all these embeddings here. The theorem says, and that's maybe something. If you are not comfortable now with classifying space, we have to talk about. <coughs> this is classifying space of our little group object G. Can you think of a projective uh, space that is not constant? constant? Uh, the map meaning is it, mean it's not constant? I mean, in geometry, this is the map which takes the, uh, these uh, n plus 1 homogeneous coordinates and takes makes n plus 2, all of them by adding a 0 in the end. Yes. And you ask me whether this map is constant now in homotopy theory. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it may not, because else that p infinity would be 1, for the same reason as before. Exactly. For general g. Yes. And um, what's your definition of bg here, in that context? <laughs> I'll tell you. I mean, that's <laughs> yes. comes up with a proof. Yes. And then we can we can talk about why this is actually then uh, in which sense this classifies G bundles. Mm -hmm. So uh, this co limit here. Oh, what is it? I guess I have to write a bit now. Action is a left adjoint. So this commutes with Kohlen. So this is Kohlen of the piece AM without zero embeddings. G space is BG. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the sentence that I hope is not too mysterious, but if yes, then we will talk about it. Uh. So, what was it? Why was it left to join? Left to to what? Left the joint to um, <coughs> what exactly? <laughs> to trivial action, either or uh, free ah, anything, right, uh, okay. anything right now. Yeah, trivial so, action. Trivial action. Didn't you show me like these yeah, like eleven six, hunters? Six yeah. <laughs> Take it yeah. off. <laughs> Yeah. 
<laughs> so any functor has an adjoint, then this one has. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Contractible G space, I should say, and that is one. That's BG, and we either take this just as a, as a definition now, then of course you believe the theorem, but I can argue later on why this is. Something that classified bundles should be the universal space mm -hmm. for, for which every G principal bundle comes. So that is here. And here's a corollary still of this P infinity, which is BG now. Again, because B of the group object is again. It's another thing that we can talk about. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. B of a group is nothing in particular, but B of a commutative group is again. Wait, B of a group isn't not a group. No, you sort of lose the G action. You, you use it to construct this B construction mm -hmm. and then it's gone. Mm -hmm. well, okay, so why is this actually? Why does it preserve the B of <coughs> For the B. Well, for abelian groups, well, why does G, G is a group object in, in <laughs> G spaces. You know, the, the operation, the G operation commutes with the, with the group structure then. Uh -huh. And this, this group structure then is preserved upon passing by this quotient. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll try to, to uh, figure that out in more detail later on. Uh, okay. So, I guess that's a good point to stop. These are unstable construction results, and that's. So, uh, I should remark maybe before stopping that this whole thing actually didn't use the commutativity of our object until this corollary. Uh -huh. so this is a general construction of, of classifying space of, 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 princ of the principal fiber bundles for some structure group as sort of an infinity, infinite projective space. So maybe, I mean, just the same check of topology, maybe you know that CP infinity is a uh, classifying space for, for complex line bundles, right? Yes. That's sort of almost by definition. You have topological bundle there, and every line bundle comes by pullback from there. So that is true, and this, it's true in this in same generality in some super abstract category. Mm -hmm. It's also not, not that surprising maybe to apologize because maybe you know the middle construction of, of EG, and that's where you take the by. That's sort of a bit of what I did here, but to see it actually as a, as a, as a projective space, I haven't seen Okay, so then that's this session and end here and go stable in the next session. Nice. Thank you.